Welcome to Firearms Friday, coming to you from the Wyoming State Museum here in Cheyenne, Wyoming. I'm Evan Green. I'm the firearms historian for the museum. And just as a sidebar, the history of Cheyenne. Cheyenne was established in 1867 as an end of track town for the Union Pacific effort in the Transcontinental Railroad. And many of those end of track towns and their camp followers and hangers on, uh, those towns just disappeared when the track construction moved on. Cheyenne survived uh, and became a center for the livestock industry in this area, both uh, cattle and sheep. So anyway, today we have a couple of revolvers and I want to kind of focus on this one. This is a model of 1892 Colt revolver. And you probably know that the United States military adopted the Colt single action army revolver, this one, in 1873. It is chambered in 45 Colt. And this, this one is neat, and we may do a, a video focusing on this one at some point in the future, because this is, is, is marked with the U.S., so it was an issued handgun to some cavalry person in the Indian Wars of the 1800s. But anyway, this was the issue, official sidearm, for the United States military until 1892. So these were carried by Custer's 7th Cavalry at the Battle of the Little Bighorn and in every other Indian War encounter until it was replaced by a double action revolver, this model of 1892, which is chambered in a caliber 38. It's 38 long Colt which was a predecessor of the 38 Special cartridge. And this was greeted with great enthusiasm because of its technological advancements. The old single-action Colt, you had to open the loading gate on the side, punch out the empties one at a time, put them back in one at a time, close the gate before you could get back in the fight. The double-action revolver when you opened that cylinder, you could eject all of those cartridges, empty cartridges at one time, and reload all six, close the cylinder, and you're ready to go again. This one has had the martial marks, the US stamps, ground off. And that is not uncommon for people who have a firearm with that United States property on it. It's, you find it a lot with um, model 1911 semi-automatic handguns that have found their way into the civilian population. People think, oh my God, I've got this, it was probably stolen from the military. No, there were legitimate ways for these to move into the civilian population. <clears throat> So, the first trial by combat for this revolver occurred during the Spanish-American War, the Philippine-American War, and the Moro War. Spanish-American War went from April of 1898 the final peace treaty was signed in December of 1898, but basically the fighting was over in July, late July of 1898. So we spent about four months fighting the Spanish, and that ended up with the United States in possession of the Philippines, and for the next 14 years we went about very efficiently killing literally hundreds of thousands of civilians and military Filipinos. Not, in my opinion, a very proud time for the United States. When the United States pushed Spain off the Philippines, the Philippine people 
Al Guanado was one of the head guys, thought that, oh, the Spanish are gone. We've got our independence. Yeah, nope. United States hung around until after World War II, did not give Philippines independence until 1947. So again, the Spanish-American War was fairly short. 260 sailors died when the Maine blew up in Havana Harbor in February of 1898. And again, the war was over fairly quickly. Uh, by July, Spain was, was suing for peace, so there was, there was only about 350, 360 Americans killed in combat but over 6,000 died of heat exhaustion and uh, disease in that period of time, which included our uh, possession of the Philippines until December of 1898. So again, the Filipinos were expecting that they would get their independence. Spain's gone, the United States threw them out, but that didn't happen. So on February 5th of 8. 1899, the Philippine-American War started, and that went on until, uh, formally until 1902, but there were still incidents after that fact. And the, the war with the, with the Filipinos started on kind of an incident when the National Guard from Nebraska, a couple of guys from the National Guard of Nebraska were at a, a checkpoint and a couple of Filipinos came towards them. They didn't speak Spanish, Filipinos didn't speak English, so there was an exchange and the Nebraska guys opened fire and that basically kicked off what came to be known as the American-Filipino War or the Philippine insurrection because they wanted their independence, or I think you could legitimately call it the Philippine War for Independence, which didn't turn out so well. So anyway, that war, the Philippine-American War, the Philippine War for Independence, terminated basically in 1902, although there were still continuing incidents between American troops and Filipino freedom fighters. So it gets complicated from here, but the area of Mindanao was peopled by Muslims, the Moros. And the Americans decided for whatever reason, we need to go in and sort out these Moros. And they were, they were warlike, they, were, um, <laughs> they held slaves. They uh, were pirates. <clears throat> they warred between clans and groups. So the United States thought, well, we need, to, we need to introduce these folks to the wonders of American democracy. And that resulted in uh, lots of unfortunate incidents and when many, many Moros, men, women, and children were killed by American troops. So again, at the time of the Spanish-American War, this was the issue sidearm. And one of these was allegedly, I'm going off on a rabbit hole here, but one of these was allegedly salvaged from the wreck of the Maine, which again went down in Havana Harbor in February of 1898, and was given to the Assistant Secretary of the Navy at the time, Theodore Roosevelt, who allegedly had it in his hands when he led the charge up San Juan Hill. What history... <laughs> and I'm off on a sidetrack here. But what history doesn't tell us about that particular incident is that probably the first person up San Juan Hill or Kettle Hill, which is actually the hill that the Rough Riders went up, was probably a Buffalo soldier because the 9th and 10th Cavalry, fighting dismounted because their horses didn't make it to Cuba, were under the command of General Pershing, General John Pershing, and they were in support of both the regulars and of Teddy's volunteers. But if you've seen that classic picture of Theodore Roosevelt, at the top of Kettle Hill, surrounded by his Rough Riders, what I found out doing some of the research on that fight is that it was a cropped picture and they cut out the black soldiers, they cut out the Buffalo soldiers that were instrumental in uh, the charge up 
Kettle Hill and San Juan Hill. So anyway, sidetracked, sorry about that. Anyway, uh, the Moros were, quote, fanatical. And that means that's anybody who probably disagrees with us and takes arms to maintain their own integrity. But they didn't have many firearms, but they were excellent warriors with uh, edge weapons. The famous Philippine Chris, which is a wavy bladed sword. They had bolo knives and uh, would, would just bravely charge into a situation with their edged weapons. The, in particular, sometimes the Moros, there was a cult of the Moros that were kind of equivalent to the kamikazes in World War II by the Japanese. They knew they were going to die because they were going to charge into a situation where Americans were armed. One of the catchphrases of the Philippine-American War and the Moro War was, we will civilize them with a Craig because the Craig Jorgensen was the issue rifle at that time. But anyway, this 38 caliber revolver on numerous documented <laughs> instances, all six rounds failed to stop a charging Moro warrior. So uh, what they did, what the Americans did was issue to the troops in the Philippines either these original Colt single action 45s or what was called the artillery model, which had been modified to shorten the barrel to five and a half inches from the uh, existing seven and a half inch barrel. <clears throat> but the failure of this firearm in combat led to two developments of more efficient handguns for the United States military. There was the 1909 Colt revolver, which became uh, or was the Colt New Service, and it was chambered in basically the same caliber as the original Colt Single Action Army, and also led to the development in 1911 of the Colt semi-automatic handgun chambered in 45 ACP, the cartridge specifically developed to replicate the uh, performance of the 45 Colt caliber in the old single action army. And I have to wonder, although it's been over 30 years since the United States military discontinued the 1911 in 45 ACP and adopted at that time the Beretta in 9 millimeter. So again, 9 millimeter, basically the same diameter cartridge as a 38. And I, I believe it's correct that some special units in the United States military are still using the 1911. And some folks who have actually seen combat with a nine, with a 9 millimeter handgun have said they wish they might have had a 45. So again, slow to learn the lessons of history. If you have any comments or questions, you can put those in the comment section, or you can call the museum. I'm not here every day, but they'll take messages, and I will get back to you if you want to talk about guns or history or United States military. So thanks for watching.